All right, so w welcome everyone. So this is a workshop on environments and the evaluation for, for AGI. And the structure of this is we're, 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 we're going to start with a substantial uh, keynote address by uh, Julian Togilius from the Computer Science and Engineering Department at, at NYU, who's been thinking and, and writing about this topic for, for, for a while, games as uh, environments and, and benchmarking tools for AGIs. Then, then uh, Christian will give a brief talk, and I, I, I will give a, a brief talk overviewing childlike IQ tests, and Christian will talk about task-based frameworks for evaluating AGI. And the, the intention is that these talks will not consume all, all of the time, and we, sh we should be able to open up some, uh, some in interesting discussions on the, on, the, on the general topic of evaluation and environment for AGI, which is a, is a tough topic because sort of AGI is not just one thing. People are building different kinds of systems with different strengths and weaknesses. So you're getting, getting people to agree on one approach to environments and evaluation certainly will not be possible, but at least we can explore together the different approaches and, and their different characteristics. So. Without further ado, let's let uh, Julian say what, what, what he has to say. Thanks. Right. Um, can you hear me? Yes, you hear me. What? Brilliant. <laughs> tell, me, tell me if you don't hear me. Um, so, I'm Julian Tegelius of New York University at the second computer science department. We have two these days, just to confuse everybody, myself included. Um, and I also hang out with the or I sit, share offices with the Game Center, which is the Game Design Department, which is also just confusing everybody. Um, right, so I'm going to talk about games as benchmarks for artificial general intelligence. Um, I'm happy to you for you to interrupt me if there's like something you obviously, you know, something, something I should have mentioned, or you just like vehemently disagree with me, which you may do. I might say a few things which you may be in it to disagree with. Um, uh, anyway, before I start, a few things about who I am. Um, I grew up in Sweden. Um, I went to school. I finished school, despite everything. Um, I, um, I, had you, uh, I had huge issues with maths. I did not want to touch maths ever again. I hated it. I couldn't stand it. Um, but I really wanted to understand the mind. So I went to university, studied philosophy and psychology, but I was basically too impatient for that because, you know, philosophy, you get like great, you, know, um, um, you get like a conceptual revolution every hundred years or so, and, you know, I, I wanted something to happen before then. Psychology, likewise, really, things doesn't, don't move that quickly. I needed to build a mind in order to understand it, so despite what I um, had promised myself when I finished school, I found myself going more and more into computer science and um, becoming one of them. Um, I, um, I know you work at an engineering school. How, how's that? How's that? You know, so basically, I, I, I was in Sussex with the I was a lot of people for a bit from Masters in Essex for a PhD. Um, I did a postdoc with Jürgen Schmidhofer in Milano, um, same place where Bas, one of the program chairs is from. Um, and I sort of moved more and more into artificial intelligence. I thought I was going to use robotics for my AI research. Um, I came more initially more from a biologically inspired approach, and I thought I was going to use robotics for that. Um, and as it turned out, you know, robotics are also very slow. I mean, they take a lot of time, they break down, you get oil on your hands and stuff like this. I didn't like that. So I decided I could use the same stuff, I could use games for this, and that's what's been happening ever since. So these days, um, uh, I have a game innovation, I would call it, and I work equally, in equal amounts, I would say, on games for AI and AI for games. Um, these are two different things. Um, very often, I do work which has basically relevance for both of these goals, but these are two different things, um, which many people in uh, see as I can even get over really understand. This book is going to be almost exclusively about games for AI, using games for benchmarking and testing and developing AI, um, and more specifically, artificial general intelligence. 
but there's also lots of interesting stuff. I will mention that in the end about using AI for making games better or stuff. <clears throat> so let's start with the basic idea. Games as AI benchmarks. It's basically as old as the idea of AI and as the idea of computers, as probably you all know. I mean, Turing, back in the days, he he reinvented the minimax algorithm, however, however you say it, to play um, to play chess even before he had a computer, um, and play chess using doing the calculations on paper with himself. Um, and since then, basically, I mean, the, the first the first reinforcement learning algorithm was by Samuels um, um, at IBM in 1956, I think, or 57, or something like this. So basically, using games has been has a very long history. And it has a very, I mean, games have a number of very, very strong things to say for them. Basically, it's faster, cheaper, technically easier than robots, while uh, reserving many of the interesting problems for um, AI that robots um, give us. Um, and abstracting away some problems. And some of the problems that are abstracted away might be interesting, handling all this noise and stuff like this, but you can, you can, you can basically inject them into games artificially. Um, and some of the game problems that are abstracted away are, to me, frankly, uninteresting. Um, and so games are made to challenge human thinking. So basically, I'm, one thing to remember, I'm, I'm not talking about Christmas Dilemma, mountain cars, um, uh, and, and, uh, very, and, and these sort of very similar uh, mathematical games. I basically, when I say games, I mean games that someone, like, like a human, would actually play. Um, um, Games are made to challenge human thinking. The reason why we want to play games um, is that they exercise our brain. And a number of theories, a number of converging theories from game design, from developmental psychology, from machine learning, um, basically come together on the idea that you know, a large part of the fun in game is learning to play it. Um, if a game is trivial and you can never get better at it, um, because you just win from the start, it is no fun. If a game is impossible and you cannot get better at it, because it's impossible. It is no fun. Um, that's the way most people feel when they try EVE Online or something like this, which is a game that for most people is simply impossible. Um, uh, games that are very well designed um, and appeal to a very large amount of people are games where you sort of um, constantly learn more about the game. You get deeper and deeper into it. Um, and games that are designed by people who know what you're doing have this property. Which is one of the reasons why, if they are built to sort of optimally challenge our thinking, they should be excellent AI benchmarks. At, at least this is one of my sort of you know, foundational statements, um, which you're welcome to disagree with, but but, um, uh, but I think so. Um, right. So many people have had these ideas, um, as we see in the history of board games. We have starting here in black and white, John McCarthy playing chess against something the size of a small room. Which, which probably has a few kilobytes of memory. I can't remember exactly which computer it is. Then we have Kasparov being beaten by IBM's Deep Blue. Um, and then in blue, um, we have um, DeepMind's um, AlphaGo um, winning over at least it all. Which, to my mind, might be the last big um, computers versus human board game event. Because basically what we had there was that <coughs> um, this was the last game which a large number of people deeply care about, um, which um, um, where compute what were humans were still unbeaten, and uh, we it's the evidence is now that we've far surpassed the best human players since. Um, so I mean you can construct other board games um, which humans might be better at, or more at other classical board games, but. Those are constructed board games that people won't really care about. Then there are other board games which humans are far better than computers at, um, which we're not going to go into here, but these are like non classical board games. Diplomacy is one of those. I don't know if anyone has, anyone, any good here has played Diplomacy? Like the Drew here's lost a friend of Diplomacy? <laughs> <laughs> it's an amazing board game where you play, where you basically play in the original version, you play the First World War, but it's actually all about negotiation and shaking hands, looking each other in the eye, and trusting each other, and then backstabbing each other. Yep, <laughs> it's amazing. Um, and, uh, and currently we can't even hold a meaningful 
compute the human match in this game because um, we don't have the natural language capabilities. But looking at classical board games, I would say that, I mean, it's over. Um, that's it. We need to move on. So video games. Um, these games are here. Um, all of these games are games for which we currently have active um, uh, game-based AI competitions running at some of the game AI conferences, which are IEEE Computation Intelligence Games and uh, AAAI's Artificial Intelligence and Interactive Digital Entertainment, um, a bit of a mouthful. Um, <clears throat> and we see here StarCraft, Super Mario Bros. Torx, which is a car racing game, and Unreal Tournament 2004, which is a first-person shooter. Um, which one of these games is hardest for, uh, for our computer? What do you think? Starcraft. Starcraft? Yeah. Definitely. Why? Uh, it's quite complicated. There's a lot of variables and yeah. barriers. And You've got strategy at yeah. a pretty high level as well as yeah. the tactics is probably easier to com for the computers. And the, the yeah. multiple layers of strategy are very subtle, actually. Yeah. I, there's been a rumor that DeepMind will attempt StarCraft next, actually. Mm -hmm. There's a rumor that DeepMind will attempt StarCraft next. Um, I do not know whether that is true. Um, it is true that there's a rumor. <laughs> <laughs> I, just start, I just started it. <laughs> <laughs> no, the beautiful thing with StarCraft is that, um, is that there are so many levels of reasoning. So that's basically the micro, the tactics, um, the micro is basically on a sub-second level moving your individual units back and forth. Um, best StarCraft players, which are current, which are treated as basically as sports stars in Korea, um, which is a spiritual form of StarCraft, even though it's a US game. Um, um, also, also by the way, I think a, a civilization which treats like game players as sports stars. I mean, it's a civilized civilization. I, I, I like that. But um, um, anyway, so they have like click-through rates of like you know 300 clicks per minute and so on to move all units around. They have the tactics. You have the economy, which which increases the mining in what proportion? You have the build order. You have the overall strategy of moving your troops. Um, build orders whose units you're going to build, which upgrades you're going to get to build with, um, to be able to build which units and so on. And there's just an enormous amount of depth, and there are so many layers to this game. Um, um, Super Mario Bros. and car racing are surprisingly enough not solved. You would say. Um, you can't, we don't have something that consistently outperforms humans. Unreal Tournament um, depends on how you see the game. If you give it access to parsed nice information, it's essentially solved because in a first person shooting such as this, you um, just human reactions will basically win for you. But um, if you give it the raw screen feed, it's not solved yet. Here's some examples of what it's currently looking like. So this is, um, this is from uh, an old video on actual people from our first sort of um, um, Super Mario Bros. The Mario AI competition 2009. Um, this entry surprised us because it played so extremely well. And the levels we had at the time, which were like all linear, um, it beat all of them. And as far as we could see, it played perfectly. Um, hard to measure, but probably. Um, the, and, and also it plays in this sort of you sort of have nothing to watch because basically he does these things that no human would ever do, jumping in the last ever picks and so on. This is a completely deterministic game. Um, you have, and in this version with these levels, um, you have um, uh, essentially perfect information. Because <laughs> you it. Yep, you couldn't do that. You could do. Um, um, uh, this is an HR algorithm planning in state space. We were sort of sad when we, when we saw this. We thought this was an interesting eye problem, and hey, someone does a star in state space, and uh, well, that's boring. Um, so um, what we um, uh, what we did was start creating a number of other levels, which had like which would force you to backtrack to other rooms to go back. So basically, adding a, a, a bit of like cul de sacs into the problem, and the, the pure A star would lose, and a couple of hierarchical um, 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 algorithms with A star at a lower level and evolved rule sets at a higher level would actually win. Um, here's another example. This is um, for the 2011 leg of the Simulator Car Racing Championship, um, which um, I was part of starting, and then I left it to the Italians because they were more crazy about it. Okay. Um, so basically, it's an, it's, a, it's an okay 3D racing game, okay physics. Um, 
the state of the art here is that um, the uh, best controllers basically drive, if they're alone on a track or they're ahead of you, they will drive faster than you and finish the race, um, uh, finish the race faster than you in the middle. If you are ahead of them, or there are multiple cars on the track, um, there is no one has yet submitted um, a, oh, no one has yet submitted, as you can see, a car that really handles overtaking really well. Because they're easy to block and they're easy to sort of, you know, there is a damage model. You get penalized for crashing too much. But still, I mean, you, um, <clears throat> um, a human could easily outmaneuver the other cars. So even that's not quite, quite sold. But in the last few years, there, there hasn't been much progress with many groups working on it. For a couple of years, it was a fairly big topic. Um, yeah, if we go on here, we can, there are some interesting crashes and stuff later on. But <laughs> we're here for science, but for watching some that cars crash. <laughs> um, so the problem here is overfitting. Obviously, you develop um, an agent that can play one of these games, and you will. Um, not, um, I mean, it, I mean, the best starter player cannot play Super Mario Bros. at all, or Torx at all, because, you know, you wouldn't even know how to interface it to the game. Um, you don't have the same notes representation, you don't have the same actions. Most of all, you just don't have the same problem. And they're all domain-specific engineering, or, if we might say it a bit more, uh, a bit more candidly, hacks. <laughs> So the state of the art, like in Torx car racing, we have hand-coded heuristics um, optimized with evolution, um, but a little bit. Um, I think Cobostar is the current the current best um, controller. Um, it has a little bit of learning of the track. Basically, it's the first time it drives a lap on track. Uh, when the first lap on track, it um, learns to um, figure out where the sort of tricky parts are and remembers it and knows the speed again. But it has a very little of um, what we call AI, except the sort of offline um, optimization with, um, with evolutionary computation. Interesting enough, and this is, this is a pattern we see more and more, um, or we see over and over again, it's like the first time you run this kind of competition such as this, like naive and ambitious people submit their best general AI solutions to the problem and don't do particularly well. And then you run the competition a few more times, and people come up with these sort of very clever hand-designed things, with hand-designed sort of um, solutions, where they put the best sort of domain-specific strategies into the code and uh, perform much better. So it's yeah, it's a domain knowledge versus versus AI. Basically, AI goes out and domain knowledge goes in. Go. We have deep learning plus MCDS, which is a fairly general. I mean, we're talking about the um, um, deep minds alpha go now. Um, uh, deep learning plus MCTS combined in an interestingly clever way is a fairly general um, solution. Um, however, and they say this could essentially work for any perfect information game. I'm not so convinced of that um, um, because basically my take on it is that if you wanted to design a game which a convolutional network would be able to play well, you would design it all. It has exactly the right, um, exactly the right properties for this with also the local structure, and which is uh, the same all over, plus the local structure. Um, <clears throat> so the important thing is like, AlphaGo was trained for like months of training time in order to be able to play a game and um, uh, lease it on. Even if, you give, even if the same architecture could play another game, you would have months of training time again to sort of teach it out. So that's not particularly general intelligence, I would say. And StarCraft, which is probably the, I mean, almost certainly the hardest of any game we've talked about so far. StarCraft is way harder than Go. Um, I mean, the reigning champion is a horrible clutch of if-then statements. It's terrible. It's a disgrace. It's a shame for AI research. <laughs> That's a bold statement. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, but I mean, it's, I think it's called Overlord, um, or Overmind, or something. The, uh, and it's made by someone who is it's not an academic, um, it's just a very good starter player, who, and he encodes all his best strategies into the code. And that's what, it, what happens. And it wins. Against all the clever AI solutions. Okay, so we have an issue. What are we going to do about this? I mean, using individual games as AI benchmarks, 
And by the way, what I'm saying here is true for board games as well. I mean, Deep Blue, brilliant engineering, but basically a lot of like domain specific um, sort of heuristics um, put into this. Um, yeah. Uh, design games that actually require intelligence? Yeah. That would be good. But these are the games that are best designed for humans. So, my take of it. Basically, I, I never show questions or slides, um, and if I do, I show one, and it would usually be this one. This is, um, I guess most of you are familiar with this, this is Shane Legg and Marcus Hutter's um, formula games first. So, I think requirements is like, yes, they should be good games for humans to play. We could easily invent any number of crap games um, and test the performance in those, but um, how relevant would that be? I mean, for example, I haven't done this, but I think you could easily automatically generate games that computers could play, but um, humans would be completely chanceless at. Um, here's a game with like, you know, five million states um, connected in completely incomprehensible ways, um, and you have 100,000 actions that you, um, to try, and it's like, it's hopeless. You have no way of even developing any kind of intuition or tapping. A computer could do basically a one step look ahead search and win over you every time. Which does not mean that one step. And then you could develop like a million variations of these games with different state tables. And, and one step look ahead would win over you every time. That doesn't mean that one step look ahead is more intelligent than you are. I, at least that goes to most of you, I hope. But, um, but basically, it just means that the benchmark is perhaps irrelevant. So we need to have good games that are good for humans to play to keep the benchmark relevant. We need to challenge a broad range of context games. And here's the issue with straight board games, is that they are fairly narrow. It's essentially all reasoning and planning. Whereas games actually can challenge much more than that. Perception, reaction, coordination, um, all kinds of like um, timing and so on. And importantly, it should not be one game. It should be a number of different games. So basically, agents should be testing games that are unseen by the developers. So basically, if you're developing an agent, um, you can absolutely not know what, ca what games you are, you are being tested on. Um, right, so start with a general gameplay competition. They made this very nice picture. I like it a lot. Um, this is basically, and which pretty much illustrates what's happening over here. We're talking about classic board games and um, classic board game-like games, mostly with discrete info, um, discrete movement, turn-based games, um, perfect information, even though that's not completely necessary. Most of the games have perfect information, even though you can have not perfect information these days. They have lots of, lots of restrictions in, in, in various ways on, on, on what games you can have, but, but these are the type of games. So basically, <clears throat> They're described in um, what's a game description language, which is simply called game description language, which is a uh, prologue-like variant of data log. So it's essentially first order logic, um, which makes these descriptions extremely verbose. So tic-tac-toe it can be defined in like a three page, um, uh, three pages of, of text in this language. Agents are given the full description of the game. So basically, when you submit an agent to this competition, um, it's given a full description of the game and some time, I'm not sure exactly how much time, an hour or so, to basically crunch this description, reason about it, come up with its own best sort of um, way of, 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 playing, of playing this game, and then play the game. Um, usually, um, playing is done with Monte Carlo Tree Search. Um, anyone here never heard of Monte Carlo Tree Search? Just struck me that it might not be a... Yes, good. Um, Monte Carlo Tree Search um, is a beautiful, beautiful algorithm that came out of research on Go um, around 10 years ago. It's um, a statistical tree search algorithm. So it's a bit minimax, like minimax, where you sort of look ahead at what kind of um, and uh, what kind of actions you can take and what kind of actions the opponent can take if it's an adversarial game or just otherwise just what sort of actions you can take in the future. But you don't necessarily need to have an evaluation function that tells you how good a state is. You can, be, you can estimate that by rolling out until the end. So basically doing random actions and see whether you win or lose the game in the end. Um, which is so simple and so nice. And then it basically builds these unbalanced trees. Um, 
um, and um, because it sort of it acts as the best first the best first algorithm and goes down the routes where which are most promising, most interesting right now when it builds the search tree. It's um, you're going to hear more about it because this is the algorithm that essentially makes general game playing possible at all. Um, so much of the progress in this in this competition is really about reasoning about the games. Um, and every time you this competition is run, they make a handful of new games, but largely because it is very, very hard to make these games in this very verbose language, um, they tend to be fairly simple games and variations of other games that existed before. Moving on, the next thing is the arcade learning environment. So this is, we see here are screenshots from, um, from the, this um, arcade learning environments, and they don't look so hot by today's standards, um, because it's based on the animation of a machine from 1977. These games here, we have Breakout, and then we have, I think, Freeway, and a version of Pac-Man, not the best version of Pac-Man, and Defender, maybe? Um, not entirely sure. Um, <clears throat> So basically, it's based on an uh, emulation of the Atari 2600. Um, Atari 2600 is a very fast machine to emulate. It had, I think, a 1 MHz um, 6502 processor. Um, it had 128 bytes of memories. I'm, no, I, there's no kilobytes or megabytes or gigabytes in it. That's 128 bytes of memory. Um, um, there's no screen buffer. Um, the programming a game for this includes keeping track of where the electron beam on the TV is at any, what scan line in this case at any particular time, so that you can update, you can change around what amounts to screen memory before that part of the screen is updated. It is probably the, one of the hardest platforms to develop anything forever. Um, most games had to fit into like two kilobytes of ROM, which was on a cartridge. Um, it had no system timer, so you could not really do a random number generator. Um, in any simple way, um, which, is, which means that most games are completely deterministic. Still, it was extremely successful. It has a, it has a, like, a game library of like four or five hundred games or something like this in total, um, including lots of the classics. I and mean, you have Breakout version of version of Pac-Man, uh, something some version of Defender. You had even had some very very simple platform games. You have the classical adventure, which is like the precursor to all sort of graphical. Um, adventure games like Zelda and so on. Um, um, some of the games are actually good, um, but it, it, it is a very, very simple machine. So in this a &E framework, um, it, you have this emulator, um, and then it basically um, runs the games for you. You get the screenshot, raw pixels, um, 256 by 128 pixels or something like this, I think. Um, and um, and then um, your agent is fed the raw screen data and needs to reason of this and return the joystick commands used to play a game. Which is a pretty interesting task, so there's a lot of perception involved. Most successful agents um, are based on deep learning. This is by, by, by far and away the most famous of these benchmarks because it was used in, the, uh, in DeepMind's um, Nature paper from last year, um, where they showed that they could train deep neural nets with Q-learning to play these games. Um, and this, I don't know if this is not readable from back there, sorry, this is the, a figure from the actual paper, which basically shows how well it performed on each of these games. And the dividing line there is, um, the horizontal line there, is um, at human level or above, uh, or below human level. So we can look at here, basically, video pinball, boxing, breakout, robot tank, crazy climber, and so on, um, are way above human level um, um, in game playing skill. Whereas um, things such as Chopper Command, SMDP, Saxon, Alien, Sequest, Miss Pac-Man are much below human level. But interesting enough, it actually managed to play the majority of games available in this benchmark at the time at human level or above. Which is, I'm not going to, I mean, there's a reason this got into nature. This is very impressive research. Very, very impressive um, um, uh, results they got here. Um, however, is it general intelligence? 
So basically, looking at how much you train these games and, and these networks, you train them for about 38 days of gameplay per, um, so more than a month of gameplay time per game. So if you play the same game for like eight hours a day for three months, you probably be good at it. Um, so a network train for a particular game cannot play any other game. So there's no transfer learning. There's some, there's, there's some papers that come out afterwards, I haven't looked much deeper into it, with some results on transfer learning from one game to another, but not very strong results. So basically, it's not like the train a big deep neural network can suddenly play all these games. You can train and then you can play Breakout, but not Pac-Man and not anything else. Yes? Okay, I understand that uh, these are games played by humans mm -hmm. and uh, manually where speed matters, not, not like yeah. a chess that you can you can just say what they're moving, but speed matters. So how, how you compare this if this human uh, factor is taken in, into account because... It, it is, basically it is, um, um, in practice, sure, you have an advantage by having superhuman, um, by having superhuman uh, reactions and so on, but in practice, your mm -hmm. um, your your advantage is not that big because they're all designed. And if, this goes back to the original: we need to work in games that are good for humans, to, for to be human. These games are designed to be beatable by humans. So basically, you have an advantage by having superior reactions, but not that big an advantage. Um, the worst sort of yeah, in a game such as Counter Strike or in your tournament, a uh, first-person shooter, you do have a huge advantage, and that's a problem. Um, but in most games, it's um, manageable. And any games where humans still perform much better than, than, uh, uh, than, than the AI, which is like all of those at the bottom here, um, you, um, um, basically what happens is that the, you know, these deep neural networks can't plan ahead far ahead enough. And humans win on being able to plan ahead. Yeah? So I guess one specific question for like first person shooters would be if you trained it on one first-person shooter and then had it play a different first-person shooter. How would that, because of the intricate, like the small differences in the... Difference. Yeah, well, good question. Someone should set up a benchmark where it's possible to play a number of first-person shooters. The problem with doing this kind of research is that um, you need to actually get hold of the um, code and you need to integrate it in the same framework and you need to, uh, and you need to have it run fast enough. I haven't seen anyone do this, I've only seen people work on particular shooters. Um, uh, some old ID software um, games are open source, including Original Quake and Original Doom, and you could probably put this together for a benchmark where you can play any of these. Something to do. <laughs> so, um, anyway, so basically looking at how simple these games are, with 128 bytes of memory, no randomness, um, and and this very simple um, state, um, basically, this very simple um, 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 uh, screen representation. Um, and we're looking at, I think the, 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 the paper says something about 50 million game frames were played, meaning that maybe you could even just make a lookup table of that size with so much computation and so, so simple games. So these are very, I mean, DeepMind work in Atari is very impressive. But I don't think this is general AI. It's very narrow. Um, anyway, yeah? So this might be maybe into your lecture a little bit more. But a lot of games will incorporate intuition that a player might receive from being human, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, it might use cues. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, it might just uh, put something shiny on a, on a wall oh, yeah. that tells you that maybe you need to go over there. You know, that uh, an AI might just never get. You know? <laughs> and, and not not for any fault of its own, but because yeah. it's not human. You know? Yeah. Uh, how does uh, some kind of AI like this? I saw this beautiful meme picture some time ago with, with a cat sitting inside a sunspot. So basically, there's part of the floor that's. Um, um, the sunny and everything else is sort of darkened, and it, um, it's just a photo of a cat. Obviously, I chose them to sort of seek out the sun because it was warm and nice. With a caption: If video games taught me anything about life, it is that this cat is a side quest for me. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 basically, yes, there are lots of conventions, 
there are lots of um, uh, there are lots of these um, really nice. Um, well, and that kind of thing would be good to transfer. Work. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's the thing, you know, if you play a whole bunch of games, if you, if you train not in one game, but a whole bunch of them, you should be able to pick these things up. Because many of these things, basically, these are conventions in human communication that go beyond games. They go into movies, and they go into design of a built environment, and if you look at it, I mean, we're not as general intelligent as we think we are. Um, actually, I'm not entirely sure that there is such a thing as general intelligence or that humans have it, but um, to the extent we have it is we are intelligent is partly because we build our built environment to sort of according to a number of conventions so that we can navigate it. And many of these things are the same as in games. Yeah? Just a digression. When you say 38 days, is that like, is that human time or the time that the game, game is played with Game time. A... I, I, I'm almost sure this is game time. But it could also be human time because basically, I think they built a neural network so that it actually takes like almost a full game tick to propagate the uh, information through the neural network because it's so big. So can you can you run a time faster in an ALE? Yes, um, you can simulate forward. It's not super fast. It would be faster. When I build sort of these other these other AI benchmarks, this is, so has been a top priority for me that you should be able to speed it up way faster than real time, like thousands of times faster than real time. Um, but um, I don't actually know what to, how much faster you can run AI. You can run it faster, but I'm not sure. And this is a big issue with a game such as StarCraft um, uh, that you don't have um, a really fast forward simulation, for example. Uh, so you you in the back, right? Um. Just something to kind of escalate what you were saying about transferability, um, yeah. and uh, just something something that was implied to me was um, about playing against itself mm -hmm. or playing against another version of itself. Mm -hmm. And this is something that the Go community has discussed, um, and we'll see if the, the AlphaGo team does it. How do you mean playing against another version of? So basically, taking AlphaGo versus mutated AlphaGo. Yeah, 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 exactly. But but also publishing results to see what happens to the board states. But um, yeah. uh, I was thinking about in the case um, right now with uh, with with first person shooters uh, and people you know build custom levels in Wolfenstein emulators mm -hmm. and do like four player you know split screen uh, people playing against each other in in a Wolfenstein environment. Yeah. So like, I mean, what would you know? What would like ten different agents like playing against each other? Yeah, so we 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 tried that in Unreal Tournament, um, but then we don't give mission information. We give it, I would argue, maybe too much information about where the other agents are. And we've had there's been a long running competition called the Two K Bot Prize, which is not about playing well, but about playing in a human like manner. It was won a couple of years ago by a team at University of Texas. Um, we also ran once in 2009, like, yeah, so people have no ran, um, <clears throat> a death match thing with, with, um, with, um, 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 with the Unreal Tournament, and basically pitched the bots against each other. Um, results, it would need to run, run again, but basically what, what happens is that because the game is not built for superhuman reactions, you get people, the best bots camp. The best boss hide somewhere and then rely on superhuman reactions to shoot anything that, that sort of comes into the visual range. They play they, in, in a very unsportsmanlike manner, in a sense. <laughs> so how, would, how would constraints at that point you know, force them to expand to, to some other logic? Because that's what they're doing. Yeah. Is there a question possible? You mean you could add the constraints? Yeah, like adding, yeah. adding constraints at that point. Yeah. That would be nice. You like could change, change the levels to make them necessary. Yeah. The rules yeah. And makes them develop. Yeah. That would be nice. Yeah. Okay. So it's a bigger topic, but but it's like yeah, you could do the design better FPS. I mean, clearly it's an interest in this better FPS benchmarks. I need to. I think I, I should not go over time too much. Um, so what I'm just saying with DeepMind and AD. We should be able to do better because they have a crazy amount of times and they're still so specific. Um, so then the general video game playing competition. Third one here. 
So I was involved in starting this, and I'm still involved in running it. Um, most of the people that organize is at the University of Essex. <coughs> so we have this Java framework, and before anyone says Java, oh no, and runs out in terror. Um, we first wrote it all in Python, um, but it was unbearably slow, and we had to rewrite it in Java because it was 100 times faster. Um, I, I stick to my opinion that Python is nice for small scripts and stuff like this, but not if you're gonna buy, if not if you're gonna write like big software. Anyway, so um, you submit your controllers, and they play a number of um, unseen games, and games that are, that you have never seen before, or controllers never seen before and then scores them, and the winner is the one that does best in terms of winning as many as possible, many as possible of these games, and as many, and gaining as high score as possible. We developed a language for this, it's the video game description language, um, which is basically, in theory, to represent most games that rely on two-dimensional movements, and where um, um, effects are based on, um, on collision between different sprites. So it assumes 2D movements, graphing and logic, and it's supposed to be compact and human readable as well, um, so you can easily develop new games. Um, so this is um, a game description. You have a sprite set at the top, defines everything there is in the game, a mapping here in the middle that maps what there is in the level description, level description you have on your right, which is a very simple little ASCII file. Um, and then you need a reaction set, which is basically what happens when things collide. Well, when an enemy collides with your sword, well, the enemy dies and you get two points. If you collide with the door and you, and you have a key, the door opens and the door disappears. Um, and determination set, how do you win or lose the game? If there's no avatar, um, you lost. Um, and if there's um, no door, you won, for example. <coughs> so this is very, very simple, compact um, descriptions, can easily be added to anyone. And it looks uh, like this. This is, um, we call it Zelda. It's supposed to be to mimic like um, um, the battle scenes of the original 8 bit Zelda. You kill monsters, you collect keys, you go through doors, that sort of things. Um, that was a human playing. Here's a random playing play, play. The random player is not so good. So, therefore, Monte Carlo Research which I mentioned before, MCDS. <laughs> it, is, uh, it, is the, it is the ship, really. <laughs> it is um, the algorithm these days. Mm. Um, <clears throat> it expands its search tree in an unbalanced manner and so on. Um, um, and here we have a version of Monte Carlo's research, Open Loop Expected Max Research, playing this game. Um, doing really well. Not always looking so far ahead. Getting the key and like, where was it going with the key? I already killed the monsters. Let me see, I should go to make, oh, there's a door, right. Um, <laughs> um, this open loop expected maps research was the winner of the um, 2014 competition, which was the first time we ran it. Can look at a couple of other games. And important, the impressive thing here is when we have an algorithm to play one game, the impressive thing here is that the algorithm has no idea about what games it's going to play. So here is Aliens, which is our clone of Space Invaders. Um, um, uh, you basically have to kill those um, aliens before they, I don't know, blow up the White House or whatever they do. Always do that in, in movies. So it's a lot about timing and a little bit about planning. Um, um, uh, it's not so fun to watch. But this particular human managed to sort of play it very well. Anyway, he wins. A random player, on the other hand, doesn't do anything very interesting. Just to show you that, you know, this is it's not trivial. I mean, you run around, you fire at random, and you will die. Um, the same algorithm as beat, beat Zelda, um, now this MCDS variation, starts with Removing all the all these sort of you know <laughs> sheets here because he actually gets score for it, and then he gets going on the aliens. It might not seem very sensible what he's doing, he, she, it, but uh, mm -hmm. actually plays very well. Um, anyone played Boulder Dash? 
Can people live? No? It's a classic game from the 8-Days. It's available on modern platforms as well. It's very, very good. You run around and you dig out the dirt. If you dig out the dirt under these boulders, they fall, they fall down. You have to collect diamonds. Um, you have to collect a certain amount of diamonds um, and, then, um, uh, and then you can reach the exit. Uh, you have to avoid these various scorpions and bats and whatever they are um, and before they kill you. Um, and uh, it's, it has this action element, um, it has a timing element, it also has a quite a significant puzzle element um, because it's easy to get yourself trapped behind those, um, um, those falling boulders and it might, it's easy to sort of inadvertently let out the, um, um, uh, the enemies and it's easy to um, uh, just get these diamonds trapped. This is human one. The random player will not win. <laughs> the random player <laughs> did very stupid stuff. The uh, MCDS player um, does is locally clever and globally stupid. Um, basically, we have an issue of not really planning far ahead enough. Actually, he got eaten by scorpions here, which is not good. But typically, sometimes he manages to win some of these levels of these games. Each, each game has multiple levels. But um, the issue is that um, you need to plan far ahead. And this is a big level where, it, where you need to do a lot of things to get, to get out of it. And typically, the rollouts, are they don't roll out um, their actions far enough. So basically, the planning becomes short-sighted, which is a problem that most agents have in games such as this one. Then we have some games which are um, um, uh, entirely puzzle-like, but no timing elements. Zen puzzle, you basically have to flip the color of all these floor tiles. Um, my PhD students are currently thinking. He should have thought before he started, started sort of um, the um, recording the video. But basically, once you color the floor tile, you cannot get back on, in, onto it. So it's very simple. Um, in concept, it is very hard in execution. And now he realizes he's stuck. <laughs> yeah, and come on, Ahmed, get going. Oh yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, and then he, then he stopped. Anyway, um, random player, <laughs> random player as well. <laughs> <laughs> this is why I done my job. Um, <laughs> obviously not not doing very well here, but not as badly as you would imagine. <clears throat> Hello, I'm a fairy. I don't know where I'm doing what I'm doing. Um, the um, MCTS variant goes straight for it, causes as many things, and quickly paints itself into a corner. And then you go on. So basically, these puzzle games are very, very hard. And interestingly, the same agents that do well on the action games don't typically do very well on the puzzle games. So what works well? Here's the, um, the most recent full results. We're running another round actually now in a few days of the competition, but this is from last year's Computation Terms and Games um, conference. The top agent here returned 42. Doesn't return 42, but it, um, it, it is like it has a number of other agents. It's sort of a hyper heuristic on algorithm selection agents that tries to predict what algorithm will play well in a particular circumstance. The second is based on, um, um, I think you'll, yeah, no. The fourth is based on a very interesting algorithm called iterative width search, which is something as simple as, um, as, as a um, a breath first search that sort of prunes away everything that changes too little or too much. So many of the other ones are MCDS variations. So um, sometimes evolutionary computation agents do really well here as well. Um, this is also a lot of interesting, but you see, like this is the 2014 results. The top controller, which was the one you saw, um, um, a place is the best in about half of the games, but really bad in some other games which some other agents are, are, are much better at. Um, so we're working on a bunch of things here, like in, with basically iterative width search, understanding why it's so good, hyper heuristics, where you basically select between a number of different states <coughs> and try to figure out intelligently which one to use. Um, early pruning of MCDS, combining evolution of MCDS and so on. Yes? So I guess I'm confused with uh, a couple of strategy games, mm -hmm. uh, like uh, 
Is it drawn on screen or just provided a, a separate channel? Um, it's, they get the information directly. Right. Um, so basically, we're currently running a two-player track as well. This is a one-day track. We are starting a learning track where they get like an hour or two to analyze the games. We rest, just ran last week and uh, last week at Ishkai a level generation track where you basically the track um, the challenge is generating levels for these games instead of playing them. Um, we might move into 3D games and make that possible inside this environment as well at some point. <coughs> um, so. A couple of final remarks before I finish this. So one thing is that there are lots of AR shadows in games besides playing them. Um, about half of what I do is about playing games. And the way most of when, whenever I do sort of public evangelism or proselytizing or whatever I do, I tell people that, you know, playing games is great, but it's definitely all not all there is. If you look at as people in the games industry, playing games is a much not a very interesting question for them, but being able to model players, generate content for games, all things like this, is a lot more interesting in many ways, testing games automatically and so on. So, um, procedural content generation is a big field here. Um, um, and, uh, these, are, these are all games, Civilization, Spelunky, Elite, War Fortress, and so on, that are based in some way on generating content parts of the game as you go along, um, sort of to cut human, um, cut the cost of development, make new types of games possible and so on. So I do a lot of research on that. Here I mention something that's not, this is not my work, this is my work of Cameron Brown, who's a pretty brilliant guy who did his PhD at his spare time after like um, working on board game design for, in his spare time for like a decade or so. This is a game, this is an evolutionary game generator, which he fed up here in the population with a number of um, classical board games and then selected among them, recombined them, tested them in various ways by automatic play out of the games. Um, <clears throat> so with inbred, drawish and so on, had a number of pretty sophisticated measures looking at, for example, how, um, uh, how, um, um, how uh, what's the sort of tension, you know, how, how early can you tell who's gonna win, for example, and things like this. And he evolved new games based on existing games. So this game, Yavalath, it's a game you can actually buy in a store. Um, the core ID is making four in a row without making three in a row, which is a pretty complex, I mean, it's, pretty, it's, pretty, it's a pretty interesting game. Um, it, it says that it was developed by Cameron Brown and Ludi, which is software, but actually, Ludi developed the game. Complete, the game was completely generated. Um, Cameron Brown just wrote the software that um, developed the game. Um, the software just didn't get any of the money. This is, um, this is unfair. But it's a really good example of like, here's a very, this is a very successful example of using AI in a completely different role and a very interesting role. Which actually has a lot to do with general gameplay. Because basically, currently every time we run the general video game AI competition, we hand design um, um, uh, 10 new games. Um, and by we hand design, I mean that I'm with my PhD students into doing it. Um, um, but basically, this is sort of, this, this is not enough, basically. We would like to be able to at any point test on a whole set of new games, or like more than 10, 100 or something like this, and have like a con constant supply of new games. So we need to go to generating these games at some point. We've been working a bit on this, we have a few papers on it, but we're far away from actually getting there. And in order to generate games, you need to test them. So part of the generation chain is to test the games. And this, and, and to do this, you need, and also for testing like levels to generate and stuff like this, to do this you need very good general game players. So these things, generate, generating games, generating levels, and playing games in general are very tightly connected, which is something, if you remember one thing from here, I'd like you to remember this, because this is, a, this is a generating games, generating content, is an as interesting as playing them in terms of an AI challenge, and the two things are like inextricably connected. Um, finally, it's a bit of a disclaimer. I talk about general intelligence, and then we're all about like taking actions in constrained spaces and planning your reasoning and so on. What are we not testing? Well, we're not looking at natural language generation. We're not looking at natural language understanding. We're not looking at storytelling, story comprehension. We're not looking at emotional reasoning. 
What can I say about this? I could say that sure, we can address everything at once. But I'd also like to say that there are lots of games which actually do challenge all these things. I don't know, I've been playing Witcher 3 a lot recently. Um, anyone played it? Oh, a few people. It's very good. It actually gets a good story. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, maybe at one day we'll be able to scale up to that. But we have a long way to go, essentially. Right, that's it for me. Um, thank you. All right, well, th thanks very much. Yeah, that, that, that was a fa fantastic overview of a lot of different things. Thanks.